Okay, hi. Hi, Lonnie. Nice um, to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, if you could maybe just introduce yourself to our uh, viewers and uh, why we're talking today. Yeah, well, I'm Lonnie Chen, and uh, I live in the Bay Area now. Uh, wife, two kids, uh, 11 and 8, 11 year old boy, 8 year old girl. And I'm running for state control. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. My parents actually came to the U.S. from Taiwan in the 1970s. Um, great American love story. They met in Ohio, fell in love got married, moved to North Carolina, which is where I was born. And then at the age of six, we moved to Southern California, and I grew up uh, in Rolling Heights, which is a city that's about, it's not a city, it's a, a town really, about 25 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and then spent a long time there growing up, went to high school there, public high school there, uh, and then went off uh, to Harvard for college and graduate school, and ended up getting four degrees uh, from Harvard. Uh, including PhD in political science, and then spent the next decade or so working in federal policy making, uh, working on big issues, health care, social security, taxes, the budget, uh, and had great experience, really enjoyed working in policy making. And then in uh, 2013, my wife and I, at the time we had one child left, just our boy, uh, moved back to California so I could take an appointment at the Hoover Institution. Uh, where I've got great colleagues like Dr. Davis Hanson and Condoleezza Rice, uh, and also a teaching appointment at Stanford. And so for the last nine years, I've lived in the Bay Area, even though I grew up in L.A. and still root for the L.A. sports teams. <laughs> we live in the Bay Area now uh, and uh, uh, enjoy our life there. I've been teaching, I've been researching, I've also started many small business focused on providing policy advice and counsel to businesses and policymakers. I'm the chairman of the board of a big healthcare system in Northern California, and I've been an investor. So, as I've kind of uh, spent a little bit more time back in California, I've had my policy experience mixed with experience in business and the private sector. And now, uh, taking this jump to, to run for an office that I think a lot of people don't really pay much attention to, uh, for good reason, people are busy and their lives are busy, but. This is an important office. It's the chief financial officer of the state of California, the person responsible for giving taxpayers accountability over how tax dollars are spent. And if done well, this job is really the watchdog of state government, the person who looks out for taxpayers and makes sure that every dollar the state spends is spent wisely and as we're told it will be. So I'm very excited about this campaign. I love the fact that I get to come to places that I wouldn't have occasion to come to necessarily. I've um, been spending uh, more time here in the Central Valley, in particular here in the Fresno area, and I've enjoyed hearing from people here about the issues and challenges that they face uh, here in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. um, well, if, if maybe real quickly you could tell us about some of those issues that you've been hearing. Yeah. Well, water is one that's on the top of people's minds this week and what the 0% allocation will mean for farmers and ranchers and their ability to get product uh, out the door and to markets around the world. Supply chain issues have been uh, big as well in terms of how it is that when we have these supply chain restrictions and things that are going on around the world, how that impacts uh, families and industries and businesses right here in Fresno County and beyond. Um, been hearing a lot about what needs to be done both on the state side and the federal side to deal with some of those supply chain challenges. And, and then honestly, a lot of the same issues that I hear in parts of the state that I'm in that aren't in the Central Valley, whether I'm in the Bay Area or Orange County or San Diego, or LA, I'm hearing about homelessness and the challenges posed by uh, homelessness and policy that maybe hasn't been, um, frankly, as effective as I think people would like it to be. I'm hearing about public safety concerns and communities feeling less safe now than they did. Well, certainly when I uh, grew up in California in, in the 1990s, it felt like a very different place than it feels now. A and we're hearing a lot also about issues relating to the economy and how we can continue to create good jobs. Um, those are the kinds of things I'm hearing about here as well as uh, in different parts of the state. And the last thing I'll say is a lot of talk about schools, particularly coming off of a time when so many schools were closed for extended periods of time and kids didn't have access to the classroom and what that meant for uh, our education system and for uh, uh, for so many of our kids, particularly in uh, communities around around the state where I think those shutdowns could, uh, couldn't have come at a worse time and mm -hmm. couldn't have affected people uh, in a worse way than, than during COVID. So um, all those issues are things I'm hearing about. Right. Um, a lot of uh, ink about the fact that you're a Republican. You've been a registered Republican all your all your all my life. life. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
you know, in running for state office in California. So I'm just wondering how, how do you get um, Democrats to vote for you, yeah. independents? Yeah. Well, it, it's important for people to understand that the job of the controller is to be an independent watchdog, not to be a go along, get along, rubber stamp. And for too often, because the political interests of our controllers have been the same as everybody else, right? We've elected Democrats to all these statewide offices, and, and that's fine, but the challenge is with an office like controller, you want someone who's not going to be able to understand. You want someone who's going to be asking the tough questions, doing the audits, making sure that we are uh, getting to the bottom of what's going on. So the case I make to Democrats and Democrats and Republicans is, listen, you want someone standing watch whose political interests are not the same as everybody else's political interests, who will ask the tough questions, and being from a different political party allows me to do that. The other thing I say is, look, I've been a Republican uh, my whole life, but I've not shied away from working closely with Democrats and independents over the years. I've done it in public policy. I've got a reputation for being a bipartisan problem solver. I'm one of the few people you meet who was appointed to senior positions in presidential administrations by Democrat and Republican presidents. I was appointed by George W. Bush to serve as a health care advisor and Barack Obama to the Social Security Advisory Board to oversee that program. So my approach, I don't think there's a Republican way to be controller or a Democratic way to be controller or an independent way to be controller. There's just a, 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 the, the kinds of things that need to be done in that job are not particularly partisan or ideological. It's about getting to the bottom of how our tax dollars are being spent and reporting that to people so they can make appropriate decisions about what the right policy direction for our state is. Um, so I, I understand. Uh, it's a question I get all the time. Uh, sometimes people are very skeptical. It's, ah, there's no way a Republican can ever win in California. And I just have to explain to people, hey, listen, what do you want for this job? If you could design the ideal person to sit in this chair to watch over taxpayer dollars, it would be someone whose interests politically are not the same as the interests of everybody else in government. And I say, well, if that's the case, then I'm your guy. <clears throat> what went wrong at the uh, Employment Development Department? Uh, um, and and what, what, you know, if you were controller then, yeah. what, what could you have done? Well, the, the EDD fiasco, unfortunately, is still unfolding. Um, we know already, the auditor has told us that there are about $20 billion, maybe more, of benefits that were paid fraudulently during the pandemic. We now know that there's 350,000 disability claims that may have been fraudulent, also overseen by EDD. So I think we're still trying to peel back the layers of this onion. Here's what I do know about EDD. This was a scandal that was entirely preventable. 10 years ago, during the, a little more than 10 years ago, during our last major economic slowdown in California, the auditor then looked at the EDD program and said, if you don't fix this program, you're gonna have a massive fraud on your hands. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Fast forward 10 years, 15 years to where we were in 2020, we did have a massive fraud on our hands because what happened? Essentially, instead of verifying eligibility, making sure people who were getting the benefits were supposed to be getting them, benefits were simply sent to everyone. And what happened is you had tens of millions of dollar, uh, dollars going to prisoners uh, at, at uh, various state prisons across the state. We know now that even more than that went to criminal enterprises in Russia and China, potentially in Russia, uh, with all that's going on with Ukraine and Russia right now, some of that California money went to Russia, and we know that. Um, and it's really unconscionable what happened because the challenge was the people who really needed the benefits, they weren't getting them. They were having to call in multiple times and say, hey, where are my benefits? I need these benefits. And they were entitled to have them, they were eligible for them, and they weren't getting them because instead of having really smart, targeted policy interventions, the system was either totally open or totally closed. So what could the controller have done? The controller could have initiated a massive forensic audit of EDD, identified weaknesses, and made policy recommendations about how we can improve it. Let me give you one specific example. We've all heard about AI, artificial intelligence. Why couldn't we have developed some kind of automated algorithm to at least make a basic screen as these benefits were going out the door, like, hey, if this person is applying from an address that matches a state prison, maybe we don't send the benefits to them. Nobody thought to do that. There was no creativity in thinking in state government. This is the thing I find so frustrating about Sacramento right now. I think a lot of people who are watching this may share my frustration, which is California is a remarkable place. We've got solutions for everything. And yet in Sacramento, they keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting results that not only are bad results, 
but actively hurtful results. And EDD is a perfect example of that. So as controller, I think we need a much more active, proactive watchdog to look for the next EDD. The last ED, EDD happened. It's tragic. That money we aren't getting back. But what we don't want is we don't want the next EDD to happen. And as controller, one of the things I need to do is to make sure that doesn't happen on my watch. That we are actively going after programs to make sure that we're identifying weaknesses and fixing them. If you were elected controller, what programs would you want to take a look at? Yeah, well, first of all, the controller has the ability to audit any program of state government at any time for any reason as well as local governments that get state money or federal money. So the ability of the controller to look into all these different agencies is, is, uh, is unparalleled in state government. So I would love to take a look at the Medi-Cal program, for example. Is it really serving the people who they say it's serving? Uh, are we actually getting benefits to people who need them and should have them? Um, we've already discovered in a spot audit of Medicaid uh, in 2019, $74 million in Medicaid benefits going to dead people. Remarkable, right? Mm -hmm. The program hasn't been forensically audited as far as I can tell since 2002. What are we doing? The program's grown 40% since 2010. We need to be able to make sure that if we're making promises to people about benefits they're getting, they're actually getting those benefits fairly and in the right way. We don't have that accountability right now. Uh, I'd love to look at all the federal money that's come in to our schools. Is it being spent in the right way? We're being told it's being spent on giving teachers more uh, more pay and more benefits. That's great, we wanna pay and compensate our teachers well. We're being told it's going to improve classrooms to make sure that they're breathing clean air. Is it really happening? Are school districts actually spending the money in the way that we're told it's being spent? These are the tough questions. I'll tell you, every single day, we can do an audit of a different agency. <laughs> And, I, and I'm excited to do that because I want to see what's going on. And we're going to publicize them. We're going to, we're going to shine light on all the dark places and hopefully make some positive changes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if I get your thoughts on the state's uh, homeless um, uh, spending. Yeah. You know, I think there was an announcement yesterday about $50 million going out um, to help house um, unhoused people. Fresno received about $5 million of yeah. that. I understand it's the highest of yeah. the, uh, the grants. Do you think that money is being spent effectively? Well, I, I would, um, I'd ask the question of people who are watching this and, and of your readers, which is, um, by some accounts, we spent $25 billion over three years on homelessness in the mid 2000s teens uh, up until the pandemic. Did it work? Do we have fewer people who are homeless now? We don't. Um, are the programs affected? I don't know, because you can't actually figure out how much we've spent individually, line by line, on all these programs. So there are certainly things we need to be spending money on. There is no question in my mind we're gonna have to spend money to help address the homelessness crisis. But the question is, what's the predicate we're trying to address? Do we need more housing capacity? Yes. Do we need mental health and behavioral health support? Yes. Do we need support for addiction recovery? Yes. Let's figure out what's actually effective. This is my basic point. As controller, I can't necessarily say, hey, go spend more money on addiction recovery. But I can tell you, hey, here's how much you're spending, and here's your return on investment. Here's how effective your spending is been. If it's a program that's doing very well, one of the things I want to do is let's grade every single program, just like we give our kids grades in school. Why don't we know, for example, Project Home Key, which is one of the elements of this homelessness spending uh, package that the governor's put on the table. How effective has Project Home Key been at achieving the results that we're told it should have achieved? Very simple, A, B, C, D. Well, if it's an A, let's go spend more money on it. We should be doubling down on those interventions. If it's an F, my goodness, stop spending money on it and spend it somewhere where it's gonna be more effective. So the homelessness is a great example of an area where we need more data, to understand where the money's being spent, where it's most effective, and then let's target the interventions that actually make sense. If it's building more housing capacity, great, let's do that. But let's make sure we're doing it cost effectively. One of the things I've heard about homelessness is we're building uh, things and converting uh, available space through Project Home Key, and that's happening at multiples above how much it should cost us to develop that stuff. Why are we doing that? Why are we spending so much more money 
when we can accomplish the same results by spending less and then directing that extra money to solve other issues we face as a society. So I, I'm, um, I wish I could answer your question with a definitive, let's go spend $50 million more here. The answer is we need the data. I'm a data-driven guy. I want to see what the data will tell us about where we can go. And once we figure that out, then we can make decisions about how we're spending our money. Um, former uh, Fresno Mayor Ashley Swearingen uh, ran for a uh, state controller yes. in 2014. Um, also a Republican. I believe she lost by about nine points. Um, wondering if you've maybe studied that campaign or if yeah. there's anything that she might have failed to yeah. do that you intended. Let me say this, she, she came uh, as close, if not closer than any non-Democrat has come in recent memory. And uh, you know, she uh, ran a good campaign. I've benefited from her advice, I've spoken to her, we've been in contact, um, not just about the campaign, but about the ideas she had for the controller's office, some of the stuff that she did when she was mayor of Fresno. I have great admiration for, for her and what she did. Um, the way that I diagnose it is that statewide campaigns in California are, are expensive. They require the candidate to be focused on a lot of different things at once. And I don't think, I think she ran as good of a campaign as she could have under the circumstances at the time. What we're trying to do is we're trying to run a campaign that is data driven, that understands where the voters are who are open and interested in hearing my message and speaking to them directly raising resources to have the most uh, well-funded down-ticket campaign for a non-incumbent in recent history, so we're on track to do that. But um, look, one of the things we're gonna have to do is compete in areas where there are a lot of people. Fresno County, a lot of people in Fresno County, we intend to compete aggressively here. I believe there's a lot of people here who, yes, they're Democrats, yes, they're independents, but they're open to voting for someone who they believe will do a good job for them, regardless of party. That's the person I want to speak to, the person who says, listen, I'm frustrated with what's happening in Sacramento. I just want someone to go up there and change it, bring fresh ideas and fresh energy. I'm your guy. If you want the same old, same old, I'm probably not going to be the guy. Because okay? I'm not. I'm just, I'm not more of the same that we've seen out of Sacramento. I don't have a, a, a politician's background. I haven't been elected to 18 different offices. This isn't a stepping stone for me. I am really seeing these things. What can I do to bring my knowledge, expertise, and energy to make the controller's office what it should be for California. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have any specific critiques of her campaign. Uh, in fact, I think it's great she got as close as she got. But we're going to do uh, what we can to take her success and build on it. Hmm. Um, so there was almost a, uh, uh, a vote on single-payer health care in California, and, and uh, that didn't end up happening. Um, if, what are the odds do you think that that could happen? And, and if you were a controller, you would be responsible for, for the, enacting the biggest tax hike. Yeah. Yeah, is that correct? Or? Yeah, it would, it would be the biggest tax hike in, uh, in, in, I think, in the history of our state. It would double the amount of tax revenue the state wants to collect. Uh, look, I think there's a couple things I'll say here. First of all, as controller, I don't have the ability to say what policy I like and don't like, and I can't selectively oversee some things and not. You do the job that you are constitutionally obligated to do, and you do it to the best of your ability. So regardless of my personal opinion on single-payer health care, uh, as controller, if that's what the people through their representatives and governor decide they want to do, uh, as controller, I, that I've got to oversee the program and make sure that it's the money's being spent as we're told it will be. That's the basic point. I'll tell you, my personal view is that single-payer health care is the wrong direction for California. Uh, I don't believe that most Californians want to be kicked off their current health care arrangements. I don't believe they want to have access restricted to doctors and hospitals that they like and trust. I don't believe that's the course for our state. I don't believe it's only going to be a doubling of tax burden. I believe it's going to be even more. I'm troubled by a bill that could require tax increases on families that make $50,000 a year. I don't think that's the right answer. That's me personally. As a voter, that's my view. As controller, you got to separate that out and say, if you're the controller, what is your job? My job is going to be to audit the program. So we're going to audit the program and make sure it's doing what people say it's doing. But uh, I have great misgivings about the effort to move towards single payer health care. Um, <clears throat> you've talked about the way inflation is really kind of pinching for you know families. This is kind of grand. All families. All families. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, what? Um, what what do you tell 
let's say that the people that live here in the Central Valley, you know, are, are, our incomes are not as high as people in coastal California. What do you tell those people? Um, if, what can you do um, if they vote for you? Like, yeah. are, you, are you looking out for them? Yeah. Well, I think it's important to be honest with people, right? The controller's not going to stop inflation. But what the controller can do is to make sure that we're sending our hard-earned tax dollars to Sacramento. And those tax dollars are so much more precious now because, you know, we, we are being pinched. When you look at a gallon of milk being 50 cents more expensive now than it was a year and a half ago in some parts of California, that's a, that's a problem for families, right? So those tax dollars become even more precious. The notion that we're sending those money, that those dollars to Sacramento to be wasted, I think is, it, it, it's very hurtful to families who I talk to who say, listen, I, I don't want my money to get wasted. I want it to be spent solving the problems that I want it to solve. And so as controller, what I can do is make sure we're taking care of that money and we're spending it wisely and giving you accountability for what's happening. And if it's not being spent wisely, you need to work with me to tell our elected representatives, knock it off, stop spending your money that way. My job is the watchdog. Remember, I'm the watchdog. And the more accountability I can give people, particularly in this environment, the better. Um, there's all sorts of reasons inflation is happening. Uh, some of it is related to longer-term decisions that have been made at the federal level. Some of it's because we've had a lot of money been, that's been printed the last couple of years. Um, those are things outside of our control here in California. All that we can do is to make sure someone's actually looking out for California families. And someone's actually looking out for where their tax dollars are going and how it's being spent, and that's my focus. I wonder if, if you might uh, have some thoughts on just what, what this uh, the war in Ukraine might mean for, for maybe those families here, yeah. here in, in the region. Well, first of all, for um, we, I've talked to some California families who have relatives in Ukraine who have family there, and it's tragic that we're, we're really seeing a, um, the ambitions of a madman, Vladimir Putin, impacting human life in this way. It's, it is tragic to see, and it's tragic for those families who are impacted by it here in California. More broadly, uh, many of us will feel the impact at the pump when we go and look at gas prices and we see how quickly that they've been rising recently. We have a global marketplace for oil, and one of the things that instability does is it places pressure on the supply of oil, places pressure on, on pricing, and we start to see those prices go up, and that squeezes and hurts and pinches California families. Um, the other thing we see is we see how much it's affected st the stock market. And you know, we talked to a number of people who are seniors on fixed incomes, who are looking at the stock market as part of their retirement, what they had hoped would be a, a comfortable retirement. And a lot of those savings are beginning to dwindle and diminish because of the gyrations we're seeing in the stock market and equity markets. That's another way that the conflict in Ukraine and Russia is impacting uh, the economy here right home in, in California. You wouldn't think something happening 5,000 miles away would have that much impact, but it is. Uh, on prices, on the stock market, and ultimately on state tax collections as well, because so much of our state tax collections in California are based on people buying and selling stocks, believe it or not. So when people are selling stocks for less, the state's bringing in less tax revenue, which means less money to spend on the kinds of priorities Californians want. So all this stuff is related. And to, to bring it back to the controller's office, we need a controller who understands this who understands the economy more broadly. I've worked in economic policy at the highest levels of our country. I understand how all these things fit together. We can't afford someone who's gonna be learning on the job. And uh, unfortunately, I think many people who've run for this office traditionally and who are seeking at this time would be learning on the job when it comes to understanding how our economy works. Um, kind of off topic, but I was just wondering if you've had many opportunities to visit uh, Fresno in the Central Valley. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite taco spot? <laughs> I don't, but maybe you can help me find one, because that, that is one thing I like going to every... I was in Downey yesterday, or a couple days ago, which is down in Southern California. The oldest McDonald's is there. They've got the original Taco Bell. They've got the uh, one of the original Denny's is down there, and so I said, "Well, we gotta do a food tour." I love, I love to eat, <laughs> and so yes, I would love to find if any of your viewers or you have suggestions on taco places to hit. We're gonna do a taco tour next time. Awesome. We're, in, we're in Fresno. We'll do that. Um, I have had the occasion to be down here a couple times. I was down here in January. I'm down here now. We've got basically we're planning on coming through Fresno or through the Valley probably at least once a month for the next couple months, maybe more often than that. Um, I like coming here because I like talking to people about what's happening 
what what's impacting your lives, what are the issues you care about. That's how I learn. That is the most rewarding part of this campaign for me. Someone asked me yesterday, like, what do you like about running for office? What do you not like? What I like is I get to meet people and hear their stories, how they came to California, why they stayed here, why they what what they're concerned about, what they're afraid of. Um, those are all things I like to hear about. So coming into the Central Valley, coming into Fresno, gives me occasion and opportunity to meet so many great Californians. And so I look forward to doing more of it. Great. Uh, maybe just give you one uh, last final pitch to make to our audience, which is business owners, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, they feel uh, burdened with regulation. Um, why, why should they vote for you? Well, I, look, I think that um, I come back to what the job of the controller is is and can be. What it is is it's a watchdog. What it is is it's the person who keeps uh, tabs on how we're spending our money. But it can be more than that. It can be a, a spokesperson in some ways for California's economy, for our businesses, for our entrepreneurs, for our investors, for everybody who's doing business in California. Understanding how we can make this place a better place to raise families and do businesses and grow enterprises. And that's what I'm devoted and focused on, devoted to and focused on. Um, having an independent voice, having somebody who's got the experience and the background to actually get it done with a vision toward how we can make all parts of our state better. I'm not just focused on how to make Silicon Valley better, even though I live there, or how to make things better in Southern California, although we've got a lot of challenges there. People need to understand the Central Valley is a critical part of California's economy. Without the Central Valley succeeding, California cannot succeed. I'm not just talking about our farmers and our ranchers. I'm talking about our innovators and entrepreneurs and people who are starting businesses. We need everyone to be successful. Uh, and if we don't recognize that, then we as a state fall together. So I'm committed to coming to the Central Valley, to learning more about what's going on here, and frankly, to being a voice for people here who don't maybe don't think they have a voice as much in, uh, in Sacramento or anywhere else. So. Um, I've been encouraged by the people I've met with here. I continue to look forward to the interactions I'll have in the future and hopefully get to meet some of the people who are watching this at some point. Lonnie, thank you for the time. Thank you. It's a pleasure, and I hope we get to talk to you again soon. Yeah, anytime. Cool. Thank you.